The Tom Woods Show, episode 1675. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now you've probably noticed that news about the virus is almost always fact-free hysteria these days. So you need my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. Go pick it up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today we're talking about people's perceptions of the rich, how they form these perceptions, what those perceptions are, how they can be influenced. Very, very interesting Of course, we have a suspicion about what people think about the rich, but it's a little more nuanced and subtle than you might think. And joining us to talk about this is the author of a brand new book on that subject, and that's Reiner Zietelmann, who is the author of The Rich in Public Opinion, What We Think When We Think About Wealth. Dr. Zietelmann, welcome to the show. Yes, hello. I am so glad to be talking to you because not only because I like what you've just done in your most recent book, but also because your book on Hitler and the policies of, of seduction. What was the what's the exact title of that book in the English translation? Yes, it is the English translation. I think the English title is not so good. And the, the bigger problem is uh, you can't buy it anymore in the United States. I'm looking always for a publisher who will publish it again. So if there is someone maybe in the audience who has an idea, I would appreciate it's a great book. I'll link to it on our show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1675, along with your current book, simply because it is a tremendous overview, especially there are a couple of chapters in particular of how Hitler thought about the market economy. And that's an evolving thing in his thinking. And you really track it very nicely. And it's, it introduces a level of nuance that is missing these days because so many people want to associate Hitler with capitalism, and it's not so clear as that. So, No, absolutely. On, on, the, on the contrary, uh, he had much more stronger anti-capitalist and uh, socialist uh, aspects in his worldview than most people are aware of, and it's uh, underestimated. Well, I want to spend uh, the balance of our time, though, on your current book, The Rich in Public Opinion, What We Think When We Think About Wealth. There are some interesting and and somewhat surprising results that you found in this book that I'd like to discuss. There's so much interesting material on this. I think back to Helmut Schuch's book on envy anytime this topic comes up, and you've got some material here on envy. Uh, First of all, when you're asking people poll questions about the rich, how are you deciding what makes somebody rich? Is Is it a dollar figure or is it you know rich when you see it? Yes, this is a good uh, question because there were a lot of polls and without any definition what they mean by rich. And we know from other polls that people have very different view what is rich. Uh, in some polls, people said uh, someone is rich if he has uh, like $3,000 uh, a month. And others said someone is only rich if he has more than $100 billion. And so there's wide range. And for our survey here, we asked people, or we gave people the definition that someone is rich if he has $1 million uh, but plus to, to his apartment or, you know, uh, with, without his apartment or without his house, in addition to it, $1 million. Okay, all right. Well, that's a fair enough uh, place to start. All right, what were you hoping to find out in this study? And did any part of it surprise you? First of all, there are so many studies about prejudice and stereotypes against minorities, against Jewish people or against uh, black people, gay people. Uh, A lot of studies, prejudice against women. There are even studies about prejudice against overweighted people. But there was almost no study about prejudice against rich people. And I think it's a, it's a, big problem, uh, not only in the United States, but much more here in Europe. And um, this this was the first poll we commissioned um, uh, Institute Ipsos Mori, and they asked people the same questions in the United States, in France, in Germany, and in UK. And so we could compare the attitude toward rich people. And one important aspect, as you mentioned, was uh, envy, social envy. We wanted to find out how envious people are in these uh, different countries towards rich people. There are some differences. It looks like Germany and France 
are in a class together, and the UK and the United States seem to have uh, similar results uh, with the two of those. I'm interested in some of the questions you asked, like, for example, which of the following professions do you think the members deserve to be rich? Or how people felt about lottery winners. Now, that was a bit of a surprise because you would think at least even today, people still give lip service to the idea that there should be some connection between the work you do and your compensation. And a lottery winner turns that completely upside down. Lottery winner does essentially nothing and is showered with wealth. And yet people have less envy and bitterness toward those people. How do you account for that? Yes, uh, this is right. Um, We had three groups. The one group we call the envious, the other group we call the non-envious, and then there's a group in the middle between uh, the ambivalent people. And if I speak about the group of envious people who uh, answered a lot of from our envy questions in a positive sense, then we saw that this group of people who are very envious, that they think that lottery winners deserve to be rich. And I think it's logical. You mentioned the book by Chuck, and even he predicted this result. But this was not based on a survey. But it's logical because someone who has envy against someone else, usually he does not admit to being envious. Because if you are envious, it means that you accept that there is someone who has something that you want to have, and this, and then you come to the point, why don't I have it? And sometimes this is a problem for your self-conscious. But with a lottery winner, you can say, oh, it's only pure luck. And so people who are envious, they think uh, that lottery winners deserve it more, what is uh, absolutely absurd than, for example, uh, entrepreneurs. You have a section dealing with the way the rich are treated in the media and in film. And first of all, even just for people to speak about the rich as if they're a homogeneous group, when this is an extremely diverse group of people in terms of the work they do and their role in society and so on. But of course, I think we all know the answer, how the wealthy are are treated in, in the mass media. And since most people, according to your book, say they don't personally know a millionaire, their opinions are going to be formed by the millionaires they see on television. Yes, this is true. And um, there was one very interesting question. And we asked people here in uh, uh, Germany what personality traits they associate with rich people. And if we asked all people, uh, these were very negative associations uh, with, uh, with rich people. But then in the next step, we asked only these, those people who know a millionaire in person. And then they had a much more positive picture. And I think we know it from uh, prejudice research with other minority groups. Uh, it's, uh, it's similar. If you don't know someone, sometimes you have a much more negative picture. And this was the case in our study as well. And then, as you mentioned it, uh, you form your picture on the basis of uh, maybe Hollywood movies. And we uh, had research in Hollywood movies, 560 Hollywood movies, and for 43, we had an in-depth uh, research. And uh, we saw that always the rich people were portrayed in a much more negative uh, way than their non-rich uh, counterparts. I think that was one of the most interesting results for me was that if people knew a millionaire personally, they were much more inclined to have favorable views of that person than thinking about the rich in the abstract. Yes, maybe I can give you some numbers for, for this thing. Please. For, for example, we had here the question uh, in Germany, which, if any, of the following are most likely to apply to rich people? And then there was a list with personality traits. And 62% of the terms said self-centered, 56% materialistic, 50% ruthless, 49% greedy, 43% arrogant. And that only after these negative traits, they mentioned some positive traits like intelligent and so And then we asked the same question, we asked which, if any, of the following are most likely to apply to the millionaire you know. 
And then the picture was much different. Uh, 71% answered industrious, 71% intelligent, 58% imaginative, 47% optimistic, and 45% visionary and uh, far-sighted. So you see a big d- uh, difference. Very, very striking. So I'm interested in what it is exactly that leads people to have the attitudes that they have. And and some of, uh, and a, a great deal of it is not, let's say, rational. Let's say it's, it's coming from some other type of uh, source or motivation. So you've got chapters trying to account for this. So first of all, chapter five talks about zero-sum beliefs. I am shocked at how many ordinary people really do believe that the wealthy have their money because they took it from the poor or something. They, they have it at the expense of the poor. If I were going to try to amass a fortune, I, I, I wouldn't go to the poor to try to get my money. The, the whole philosophy makes no sense. But the idea of, of zero-sum that if you gain, I lose, is of course encouraged by people who want to foster envy. But how widespread is that? Yes, it depends. And there's a huge difference um, between age groups in the United States, not only with this question, but as well with other questions. Um, we had this question, to what extent do you agree with the following statement? The more the rich have, the less there is for the poor. Uh, on average, in the United States, the population, there was 34% who agreed with this statement. But with young people, I mean, people between 18 and 29 years, 45% supported this statement and only 29% disagreed with this zero-sum thing in the younger people. And then I compare it now with older people, uh, what means older than 60. And from these people older than 60, only 24% supported the statement, the zero-sum thinking statement, and 53% of the older people rejected zero-sum thinking. And so we have it with a lot of other questions, uh, but this is only true for the United uh, States. For example, we, we had here one question. I think this is very interesting. We asked people in the United States, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Rich people are good at earning money, but they are not usually decent people. And um, the population as a whole, only 27% agreed with this uh, statement, but 40% of younger people agreed, and only 23% rejected the statement. With older people, exactly the other way around, people older than 60, only 15% agreed, but 50 percent disagreed with this statement that uh, rich people are usually uh, uh, are not usually decent uh, people so but this was only true for the united states this uh, difference between the age groups in germany and in france it was a little bit more the other way around that uh, older people were more negative towards rich people than younger people the difference was not so big but if there was a difference it was uh, exactly in the other direction. So this was very interesting for me for United States. I couldn't understand why that should be. Uh, but I think we know it from other polls in the United States that a lot of young people embrace the day of uh, idea of socialism and that capitalism became a dirty word. Uh, there, I think it's, uh, we, we have Right, some... I, I know, but why would that happen only in the United States? I mean, y- Europeans tend to be fairly left-wing, uh, the young people there are experiencing the same phenomena ah, okay. in the U.S. Yes, uh, it's. Um, I, I, I thought about it, and to be honest, um, I'm not sure about the uh, explanation. Maybe it has something to do with a financial crisis. Imagine someone uh, is today uh, 25 years old, and f- his first political experience was with 15 years. Maybe this is the age where you... Uh, start to become interested a little bit uh, in, in politics and to see something. And the first thing that um, his first experience in life was financial crisis. And you see the common interpretation from in media and politicians and especially from intellectuals is that financial crisis was a crisis of uh, 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 capitalism. 
And uh, I don't believe in this. I, I had a chapter in another book. Uh, I, I, I wrote a book, uh, The Power of Capitalism. And in this book, I had a chapter about the financial crisis. So I don't believe in this interpretation. But most people believe that financial crisis was a crisis of uh, capitalism. And I think uh, this is, uh, the effects of the crisis were much uh, stronger in the United States. And then there's another thing. The universities in Germany are also much more left than uh, conservative or much more anti-capitalist as pro-capitalist. But I think this is much stronger in the United States. You see it's that even what was not in other countries, that even more educated people are in the United States, are more critical against rich people, what is not the case in European countries. And I think this has something to do with this uh, very uh, strong left-wing anti-capitalist ideology uh, in uh, American universities. How about uh, the phenomenon of scapegoating? This is not something that's unique to today or this particular situation, but it may help us understand some uh, swaths of public opinion. Absolutely. It's a, it's a good question because uh, this happened always in history when something happened that people could not understand. For example, like the plague uh, in the Middle Ages. Then always uh, people looked for scapegoats in the Middle Ages. This were, uh, you, you know, witches were killed. Between 40,000 and 60,000 women were killed in Europe because uh, they were scapegoats for the, for the plague or for other things that people could not understand. And uh, today, it's uh, it's similar if you speak, for example, about the financial crisis. In the financial crisis, greedy bankers or greedy managers were scapegoats because I think it's very difficult to understand what really happened there, the, the causes of the financial crisis. And I think 99% of the people will not understand it. But um, we had one question there in our survey, and we asked people, what do you think about the following statement? R rich people or super rich people who want more and more power are responsible for all this uh, crisis, uh, humanitarian or financial crisis in the world. And uh, there was, again, a difference between uh, Europe and um, and United States. For example, in Germany, 50% of the Germans agreed with this scapegoating question. And in the United States, it was only 20, 21%, and in the UK, uh, only 25%. Uh, people in UK and United States, they think almost identical about rich people. You see it... Um, if you look at this social envy coefficient that I mentioned before, the social uh, envy coefficient is the ratio between envious and non-envious people in a country. For example, if the social envy coefficient is one, it would mean that there are as many uh, envious and non-envious people. And in Germany, it was 0 0.97. And in France, it was 1.21. That means in France, there are much more envious as non-envious people. But in the United States, it was 0 0.42. And in UK, 0 0.337. So you see in the United States and UK, the attitude towards rich people is uh, almost identical. And they are much more near to each other than uh, British people have much less in common with uh, Germans and with uh, French people. I want to ask you about uh, the way people look at how people become wealthy, whether it's through luck or otherwise. We'll do that after this quick break. Folks, with everything going on right now, a lot of people are asking if it's even possible to buy life insurance at all. And the short answer is yes. You can buy life insurance even during a declared pandemic. And if you have loved ones depending on your income, well, you probably should. It's part of what is called adulting these days, and you know you should do it. As an insurance marketplace, Policy Genius is in contact with the life insurance companies on their platform every day. They're keeping track of all the changes in the market so you don't have to, which means they can get you covered quickly and for the best price. Here's how it works. Policy Genius compares quotes from the top life insurance companies in one 
place. It takes just a few minutes to compare quotes from the top insurers to find your best price. This doesn't just save you a lot of legwork. You could save $1,500 or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape for free. So if you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they'll be there to take care of everything. So if you're one of the many people looking to buy life insurance right now, but you're not sure where to start, head to policygenius.com. Policy Genius will find you the best rate and handle the process completely. They'll get you and your family protected and give you one less thing to worry about. Chapter eight is called Explaining Success, Individual Ability or External Circumstances. And what's, to my mind, interesting about this chapter is the, the difference between the way poorer people and wealthier people answer the question of whether the wealthy got the way they are through luck or not. It's quite striking. Yes, um, uh, absolutely. I think uh, you see in all countries this uh, differences that um, successful people, they think more in this way that they are the uh, creator of their own life. And people who are not so successful, for example, economically not so successful, they blame external circumstances or they blame things like uh, luck or bad fate or so as an explanation. And I think this is a big problem today that uh, a lot of people want to see themselves as victim. But as long as you see yourself as a victim, uh, a victim of capitalism maybe or a victim of racism or whatever, you can't go forward. And in the moment, if you start to see yourself as a creator of your own life, you are the you are the boss, and you are not uh, a victim. Uh, only then you will become uh, uh, really successful. And you see it if you see the attitude of of rich people, even people who are role model in the United States, like Oprah Winfrey, for example, who became the first self made uh, black billionaire in the world with an estimated net worth of two point seven uh, billion uh, dollars. For her, for Oprah Winfrey, it was always that she, very important to say, you are the creator of your own life and uh, you are, don't see yourself as a, as a victim only of something. And I think people who see themselves as a victim, uh, they are not uh, successful in life. Let me, as we wrap up today, let me bring you a bit beyond the book and ask you, why does this matter? Why does it matter if the rich are viewed negatively in popular culture? What, I mean, this may be an injustice to them, but are there any broader implications of this, any, any ways that society might suffer if it looks upon the rich in this way? Yes, absolutely, because you have to be aware that words can become deeds. If you look in history, there's an unwritten history of uh, rich people as uh, victims in the 20th century. Look, for example, I, I think a lot of uh, younger people never heard about it, but that, for example, 500 to 600,000 so-called colleagues, that means uh, wealthy parents, were murdered in, the, in, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, only because they were rich. And similar things happened with Pol Pot in Cambodia or with uh, the so-called Cultural Revolution in China. And there are a lot of examples in history. Even anti-Semitism had an uh, economic uh, aspect. Uh, you know, my first uh, doctoral thesis, as you mentioned before, was about uh, Adolf Hitler and uh, his uh, anti-capitalist views were linked to uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic uh, views uh, as well. And uh, you have to be aware that it, it starts with prejudice. It starts with negative stereotypes. And then in the situation of crisis, then words can come deeds. And it hasn't to be so extreme like these examples with uh, Russia or with uh, China or so. But look what happened, for example, in the 70s within UK or in Sweden. At this time, there were in, in Sweden and in UK, people had a very negative attitude toward rich people and rich people were uh, scapegoated for all negative things that happened. And in the effect, they had an 
income tax there in UK, for example, was 85 percent, and in Sweden it was it was really crazy. I have a chapter about it in my book about the power of uh, uh, capitalism. The famous uh, author Astrid Lindgren, for example, she calculated that her tax was. Uh, 102 percent, and it, it was true. It was exactly 102 percent, and uh, a lot of uh, rich people, uh, like the founder of IKEA, this uh, furniture, a big furniture uh, manufacturer in Sweden, he left Sweden, and uh, for the rest of his life, he lived in Switzerland, and and this was a disaster as well for Sweden and for UK. Not only for the rich people, but for everyone. UK in the 70s, they called it the, the sick man in Europe, and a lot of people were uh, out of work and high inflation and uh, uh, everyday strikes and and a, a disaster. And this was uh, as well an effect of this uh, socialist, uh, anti-capitalist, uh, and anti-rich uh, policy. So it does not hurt only. Rich people, and and I, I want to add something. I had an interview a few days ago, and someone asked me, "Do we really need super rich people, and do we really need billionaires?" And I asked him, uh, "Do we really need successful entrepreneurs?" Because this is exactly the same. If you look at the list of the richest people in the world, or Richest people in the United States. You know, we have this Forbes uh, list uh, every year with uh, the 400 richest Americans or with the richest people uh, in in United States. Almost everyone be became rich as an entrepreneur, like uh, Jeff Bezos with uh, Amazon, Zuckerberg with uh, Facebook, like Bill Gates with uh, uh, Microsoft or Larry Page and uh, Sergey Prin with uh, uh, Google. Uh, uh, the 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 only people who became not rich as entrepreneurs are heirs, and then in this case, their uh, their father was a successful uh, entrepreneur, and they go go on then with this uh, uh, company. So, and today, what a lot of people don't know, we have more self-made billionaires as we had in uh, some decades ago. There was research done by uh, Forbes, and they analyzed the percentage of people who became rich as self-made entrepreneurs or who became rich as heirs. And in 1984, only 48% of the super-rich people were self-made. Today, 67% of the super-rich people are self-made. And these are entrepreneurs. And uh, if people t uh, tell me or ask me, why do we need rich people i you you can ask the, the same question would be why do we need entrepreneurs why do we need successful entrepreneurs and this the zero sum thinking that you mentioned before this is so crazy i give you one one example why why this zero sum thinking is wrong um look what happened in china for example in uh, 1981 88% of the chinese people were living in extreme poverty 88% Today, this uh, this uh, percentage is only less than one percent. It's the biggest reduction of poverty that ha happened ever in history, from eighty-eight percent to less than one percent. But in the same time, in China, there was an increase in billionaires like it never happened before because the socialist time there was not one single billionaire in China and today we have uh, so many billionaires in China as we have in no other country in the world with one exception United States you have more and if the zero sum thinking would be true then you couldn't explain this and i think these are only two sides of the coin because if they started there with their economic reforms in china uh, more market and more private property it began all with the slogan of deng xiaoping uh, who claimed let first get some people rich and this is what they've done to to accept that people get rich and i'm very often in china because i have their lectures about my other books how to get rich and so and everyone want to get rich there 
And if you would ask people in China whether they want to go back to socialist time because people were more equal and we had no rich people, everything, everyone would think that you are crazy. Well, indeed. Um, and that's why you're, that's one of the reasons your book is so valuable and, and, and helpful. It, first of all, lets us know where we stand in terms of public understanding and prejudice and also helps us to understand the source of these prejudices and therefore the better to confront and overturn them, I hope. Well, the book, once again, is The Rich in Public Opinion, What We Think When We Think About Wealth, uh, linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 1675. And uh, Dr. Ziedelman, thanks so much for this book of yours and for your time today. Tom, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, that's going to do it. But I want to let you know that at the end of this week, probably tomorrow, I don't know if you're listening to these in order, but the week of June 13th, toward the end of that week, 2020, I will be releasing the free ebook on the police from a libertarian perspective. So I may do an episode reviewing some of the ideas expressed in there, and then you can get that baby for free. So uh, watch for that, listen for that, and uh, hop on my email list. You get notified about things like this. You can get on there with my book about the lockdowns and the problems with those over at wrongaboutlockdown.com, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.